guys, Solazar here with episode three. Uh, we're going to be talking about Pulsar 12KW G12KBN, converting it to run on natural gas. Okay, in this episode, our expectations are pretty simple. Uh, we don't want to be chasing gasoline as we did during the last Hurricane Sally. Um, I have natural gas here. If you have it at where you live, awesome. It makes for a a comparable fuel type. Um, I will say this, you do lose a little bit of power. About 10% is what most of the, the regs are saying. Um, I would say it this way. I would rather lose 10% and be able to not chase fuel and have this thing continually run and accommodate my planning accordingly for what my loads are going to be versus running around for two or three hours risking getting creamed at some of the he the uh, street lights where we I saw a lot of accidents during the last hurricane because of power outages. So uh, for me, the investment was worthwhile and I'm going to take you through it. And then we'll talk about some of the numbers and logistics associated with what goes on and things to be considered of as you're putting these ideas and these plans together. So stick with us and I hope you enjoy this episode. Thanks. Okay, let's talk about my generator. Pulsar 12KW. I'll get close-ups for all of this for you, but the action's really happening in these locations right here. Now, previously we had a, a, a propane connection here. Okay, let's turn the volume down. And let's focus on what we got going on. So this is connecting the natural gas supply into the existing propane regulator using a needle valve to help manage the flow a little bit. The problem with this scenario was that when the load on the generator increased, the propane uh, regulator just really wouldn't accommodate that loading. So we really didn't feel comfortable with it because it just didn't, it didn't provide the, the necessary PSI that we needed. Okay, then we went to a furnace style natural gas regulator as seen here and added a, um, a gas ball valve on the attachment. This worked okay, but at the same time, we were trying to figure out how to actually increase the amount of pressure that we were actually seeing uh, when we had a load. It's all about loading at this point, and we could never get the generator to run efficiently at its, its most efficient level at a high load. Also this style regulator didn't allow it to prime very easily so when you're outside you're having to manually prime it through the hose and that became a little more difficult. The ball valve here kind of acted like a throttle as well. This setup ran okay, but it really didn't maximize the efficiency of the generator once we actually put a load on it. Plus, this style regulator was going to be really hard to mount. It was going to be external, and it was going to be in the way. It was just a lot of issues that just didn't make it real practical. The final design involved a Woodward low-pressure regulator. Here we see a 90-degree coupling that was added in order for it to actually fit in the old... Uh, propane section uh, where the propane regulator sat. In this particular scene you're seeing the spring valve here on the regulator which allows it to actually uh, prime uh, the regulator with the natural gas because you have such a long hose. I particularly like these Dormont A75 Snapfast connectors. They make just connecting up natural gas hose very easy and secure. This next frames of video is a little tough, but I'm trying to illustrate the hose that's going into my carburetor. This carburetor on this generator was already pre-set up to run propane so it just I, I just leveraged it just to, to run the natural gas. I would like to have had a little larger hose 
but it didn't seem like it was worth actually changing that out at this point. Here's another view of these Dormont A75 Snapfast connectors. I just wanted to show you guys kind of a, a little bit of a close up. These are awesome connectors for working with natural gas. Very secure, very rugged, very durable. It's really the best way to go when you're working with this kind of stuff. And I've got 70 feet of flexible gas hose. Didn't know really where I was going to actually position this in the end. Got it all kind of strapped down with some bungee cords just to keep everything together. That's the only purpose that these are serving at this point. And here we've got the floating neutral enabled on this particular generator per the manufacturer's instructions. It's always important to remember that if you're going to use this generator off the house, then you need to actually attach a plug that's got the ground connected to the neutral so that it can actually operate safely. But while it's connected to your house wiring, you want the floating neutral enabled on it. Um, this is just kind of an, another illustration of showing you where I'm at as far as in the generator housing to actually do the connection. So we had a winter storm coming in to the area, so I felt like it was probably in my best interest to go ahead and top the battery off, make sure that it was good and good to go before the event hit us. And it was pretty much done, but just wanted to be sure there's nothing wrong with being safe. I mentioned this earlier, but let me just call it out. I keep my my 50 amp plug in a plastic bag to keep it secure and keep all my hoses and everything secured with a bungee cord on top just so I've got everything together and then that cover over there is an it's actually an old barbecue pit, cup, pit cover that I'm using and I'm putting it over the top of my generator just to keep dust and dirt and just other things out of it it just gives it a little bit more longevity and just keeps everything nice and tidy and plus it just keeps it you know, visually out of the out of the way and um, needless to say it just I think it makes it look better This is what TDOR was trying to help me with a little bit. My my web hook was turning off and uh, my overhead LED lights, so I'd have to tell uh, Alexa, turn on the my Echo lights. to turn them back on that's out in the garage. Okay. It's a little irritating, but hopefully right. he's going to help me get that all worked out. Okay, so here we are at the end of the episode. Let's kind of recap what we pulled out of this. Um, planning situation associated with making sure that the regulator that you use is really conducive for, to the type of uh, generator that you're going to be using. Um, the previous examples that I illustrated, trying to go inexpensive using some uh, regulators that are really more for furnace type applications, uh, really didn't prove out to work as well as I'd hoped they would. Uh, very hard to control, very hard to to really zone in in a, in a wide um, uh, place point for the PSI. Uh, so really don't recommend going that direction. Uh, secondly, always try to use as much pipe dimension as you possibly can um, that you can afford. Uh, don't try to skimp half inch or below uh, for hooking up your generator. It may function to run the generator, but when you start putting a load on that generator, you need to have some capacity there. And you never know what time of year or what's going on when you're going to need that additional capacity. It could be winter, you've got natural gas heating, you need to be able to pull to, to, to fire that furnace up and as well as continue to run your generator. So don't skimp in that respect. Um, the fittings that I went with, uh, were specifically made for natural gas. 
you should not ever use anything that's not at least brass just because of spark aspects or something. That means stainless steel. Um, it means you could probably go galvanized, but you're run, going to run a risk of more rust uh, um, on those type of fittings. Really would recommend you stick with brass. The, the, the Dumont fittings are really commercial grade probably about 2x what you should spend or you could spend relative to that type of fitting but for something that i want to put in place in a permanent type aspect and let it see from a longevity standpoint it's worth it for me to go down that path um, i spent a little extra with my fittings relative towards um, how they're connected uh, how they're strengthened um, just made a big difference for me also associated with my inlets the inlets that we used in this particular application, I separated them in case I needed additional power demands during a summer application because a 12KW will run just about 75% of everything that I need with the, with the modifications that we've made in episodes one and two. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm gonna apply the same modifications to the three ton. I have a three ton and four ton uh, HVAC on my, my home and I'm hoping to apply the same. But I don't think that the generator will run both of those. Um, so I will probably need uh, an additional generator, which is why I invested now on the transfer switch. Uh, these, are, these are expensive type applications, but when you look at the cost associated with buying a four to $5,000 fixed based Generac or some of the other type manufacturers, and I've bought a lot of them uh, uh, in my career, uh, and they run very well. They're good products, good companies. Um, the difference is that's a five, six thousand dollar generator or more. This is a thousand dollar generator with a few hundred dollars worth of accessories applied to it to give me a better value for my money. Um, I hope like insurance that I never use it, but I have it. So after the last hurricane, I had two generators, and hear me, two, two generators, two Rock River, Rock River generators, and these bad boys exploded on me. Crankcases exploded, fan blades uh, broke down, a lot of problems with these things. Don't recommend them at all. I literally threw away two brand new out of the box generators. And I and hear me right, they sat in a box, mind you, for three years, never opened it, never never put them together or anything, took them out, ran them within 20 minutes, destroyed, completely unusable. So this time around, investing in the time up front, making sure that uh, the generator is ready, the house is ready, that I'll exercise this generator on a more regular basis. I have it as set up as a backup uh, to, to quickly apply power at a moment's notice. Uh, later on, I'm expecting to build an enclosure so that right now where you saw me roll my generator up in a, a little storage location for me right now and keep it, you know, covered uh, will evolve into a small storage location that I'm gonna probably build out of some type of uh, reclaimed pallets, most likely have a solar um, uh, panel to charge the battery on a regular basis and keep all my, my uh, components in there and have it firmly secured and locked so that it doesn't walk off. Um, and then in the event of a, an outage, it's not me dragging that generator across the yard to its location and then hooking it up. It is just literally walking out there, making the connections, firing it up and let it rip. So we'll show some of those types of elements as we continue down this path. Uh, the next episode that you're going to see from us is the actual um, inlets and panel wiring activities that we worked with with our local electrician, Russell Miles. Um, I was more than capable of doing the work, but because of the potential implications on an insurance level, um, I felt it was in my best interest to have a licensed electrician do this. I did some of the work um, and had him look over my shoulder to verify some of this and, and come back and check my work. 
uh, it's always good measure when you're dealing with some of these things where a fire or a miswiring application could result in a de destruction of property and then your insurance not paying for it because uh, you're not licensed to do that kind of work even though you're the homeowner in some states and Louisiana is one of them Louisiana the homeowner can do this type of work um, I just felt it was good measure for something of this level of severity to to have electrician kind of look over my shoulder so Good advice, in my opinion, for a lot of you guys out there, if you're even the, and I, I consider myself somebody that's uh, close to expert level in the, the fact, in the dealings with elect, electrical um, um, installations. Uh, the solar panels I did myself um, did not feel any, any uh, um, apprehension about doing that. Um, and then as I progressed over the last 10, 12 years, I started saying I should have had somebody just come back and check my work just to be able to check the box there. So I'm doing those things a little bit more as I progress uh, on so that I can protect the investment that I'm making here. So that's it for now. Tune in to the next episode. We'll get that wrapped up uh, here shortly and get it posted and we're wanting to make sure that uh, we're giving you guys a steady progression of video and content as we're going down this path uh, towards that evolution of some of the, 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 the solar autonomy, as I'm calling it now. So I hope you enjoyed what you saw. If you have any comments or have any suggestions, always leave them. Uh, happy to, to, to hear those from, from viewers and hope to see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.